morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Helsinki. In organising this event, we wanted to draw upon a very wide range of expertise and to open up a discussion around one of the most important economic issues of the current age, which is basically how will wealth be distributed? We want to work towards tax systems that promote the mobilisation of domestic resources and, above all, promote this in a way that is equitable. This is an extraordinary event. It's an opportunity for us, civil society and experts from around the world, with journalists and policy makers, to explore and share experience from many different countries about how to tackle an issue which has been confounding people since the League of Nations first started discussing this in 1923-24. For developing countries in particular, transfer pricing or transfer mispricing is a major impediment to them creating sustainable public finances. Multinational corporations, in order to try to reduce their income tax liabilities, have an incentive to allocate income to low tax or no tax jurisdictions and to allocate expenses to high tax jurisdictions. Finland is also having this debate because of the, the influx of uh, international mining companies to our north. Currently the citizens in oil and mineral rich countries do not know how much money their governments are receiving in return for the exploitation of their natural resources. In Europe we are victims of transfer mispricing and tax evasion. Um, whilst we also are perpetrators, we have uh, our own tax havens on our own doorsteps. Decades of not paying attention to these issues have led to the public finance crisis in countries across Europe and in many other parts of the world. A joint action to curb the illicit capital flight from developing countries is needed and it is necessary to advocate for the closure of tax havens. It's a great pleasure indeed that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Finland can co-host this important conference together with KEPA and with the Tax Justice Network. Let me apologize for slightly delaying the beginning of this uh, event uh, because uh, our government had yet another uh, crisis meeting this morning uh, in preparing for today's parliamentary debate on the Euro crisis. So when I am asked why is the Finnish uh, Ministry for Foreign Affairs uh, co-sponsoring uh, this kind of international seminar on transfer pricing. It has uh, at least three obvious uh, uh, explanations. The number one being that we want to avoid in the future uh, having the necessity to hold such crisis meetings all too often. Thus, we have countries in the EU where tax avoidance has been characterized even as a national sport. The present Finnish government has, in its program, taken a very strong stance in favour of reform of international taxation. Our government is strongly advocating the closure of tax havens, including by means of stricter uh, reporting obligations for multinational uh, enterprises and increased exchange of information between uh, public uh, authorities. And therefore, we are very pleased to have contributed to the uh, realization of this event here in Helsinki. By way of introduction, I want to just give you a two-minute explanation of my interest and where it began in the subject of transfer pricing and uh, the entire business of how books are kept and where profits are shown. Uh, as a young lawyer working for the United States Senate, I had a subpoena for a major oil company which permitted me to look at their books, all of their books. I had access to every paper in the building, which were the headquarters of a very large international oil company. What I found were something like 70 separate sets of books, one for each tax jurisdiction the company did business in, one for the federal tax authorities, one for the securities commissioners, and then an internal set of books for the management of the company. And my first question was, how is this possible? And why is this legal? 
for which I never really received a satisfactory answer. But what was clear was, of all the books for the tax authorities, the company lost money everywhere. On the books for the shareholders, it made money, phenomenal amounts of money. And uh, there was no real reason or explanation or excuse for it. There is criticism that the transfer pricing guidelines are too complex. So we need to simplify where possible. What's the OECD about? I think that the OECD's logo a mission statement at this moment is to facilitate better policies for better lives by developing policies that help governments stimulate growth and equality. Double taxation, but also less than single, single taxation or double exemption or double non-taxation, pose a risk to trade and thus to growth and equality. And that's why the OECD is of the opinion that a global transfer pricing standard is key, both in preventing double non-taxation as in preventing double taxation. Uh, if you read the OECD guidelines, the references to double taxation appear throughout. The references to double non-taxation are scant. I only found one reference to that in the OECD guidelines. OECD guidelines and the uh, U.S. guidelines were all adopted at a time when we didn't have Apple. In the last 40 years, we have loads of companies that who's, are engaging in activities that were never thought of at the time those rules were adopted. One big example of that is in the banking industry, where uh, every day we would at, at the Treasury have to deal with a new gimmick that Wall Street had come up with where we had no idea how the tax rules uh, should apply. How do you justify the uh, statement that the arm's length principle is the, the way to go? The OCD transfer pricing guidelines are continuously revised and updated. The arm's length principle is, of course, interpreted through the transfer pricing guidelines. It's been adopted by more than 100 developed, emerging and developing countries as the standard to use. I would urge you to share the concern of a developing country where trade mispricing is one of the big, big issues. There seems to be a consistent constituency which views India's transfer pricing regime as very aggressive. I would like to say uh, that it's a sophisticated uh, transfer pricing regime that countries need revenue and taxes are the finances of the government to provide uh, public goods. If you run into deficits uh, consistently, you are going to be uh, in a problem like some of the countries in the EU are. And then the cost is paid by the citizen, by an ordinary citizen. What we are trying to solve is who gets what share of the tax pie. The Indian government definitely needs revenue from the enormous amount of cash flow and multinational interests which are happening today in India. However, the ends cannot justify the means in which this is done. What happens today is the transfer pricing process of litigation and assessment itself is so messy and complex that we kind of lose sight of the entire thing. Transfer pricing has a basic problem, right? Many of the transfer pricing studies today are done without proper comparables. There are no method for quantification, clear method. There is a cherry picking of comparables all, all around the place. There are disparate data sources which have been used. There is a documentation overload. There is a lack of knowledge and skill set on the taxpayer as well as the other side. They are concepts which are not ingrained properly in tax pricing litigation. And in, in general, there is an overburdening of the taxpayer by this whole regime. It is not a problem with Indian transfer pricing per se. It is a problem with transfer pricing as an underlying issue. What are the conceptual level difficulties? It is like one of these self-help books we say, do good always, but it never happens in real life. right? So it is this like, you can't get comparable transactions which are identical or even remotely identical in real life. With respect to the number of variables you have to analyze for a transfer pricing comparability analysis, it's pretty mind-boggling. 
I come from an engineering background, computer science and electrical engineering, and sometimes I wonder when we do the comparability analysis that why I left that field and came into this, right? What happens really is this, there's so many variables which are going on and which are discarded and are without any scientific basis that the reality is the law should be simple. Transparency and provisions need to be simple. You can have as many theories you want, but the laws are likely to be easy for the taxpayer to follow. The system can't be fixed because there is no incentive for change, whether it be the lawyers or the accountants or whether it be the department. In fact, to put it on record, the department has done a lot more. I think the incentive for change has to come also from the industry which has been sadly lacking in India. I do think that having this sector-wide safe harbors will probably reduce the amount of transfer pricing litigation, the amount of audits, the amount of resources required, the amount of money spent, the time spent. The second solution is formulary apportionment. I, I am a big fan of FA. Uh, I don't see why that can't be considered. We can probably streamline the current provisions, but it is time for us to take a step back and look at what we are trying to solve by such transfer pricing, arms length principle rules at all. So the OECD seems to me is faced with this real conundrum. Their approach results in an unworkable, absurd system. And yet, the alternative of formula apportionment, which as the practitioner said, needs to be looked at seriously, is completely rejected by the OECD. Any objective observer would say, it's not right for the OECD to be trying to set global tax standards. But how do we get to a more inclusive global forum? What is the real prize? Is the real prize a change in this standard? Or is the real prize a change in the standard setting process, which in the longer term will mean that all countries that adopt standards have an equal say in setting those standards? Or very honored to be here to share with you China's transfer pricing system. So with the integration of China's economy into the world, more and more multinational companies have entered into the Chinese market. At the same time, the outbound investment by Chinese domestic companies have been exponentially growing. Among this investment, about 73% flows to what we traditionally call tax havens. So consequently, transfer pricing has become a more and more pricing issue for Chinese tax authority. What bothers our practitioner most is after we have done the preliminary analysis of controlled transactions, it's extremely difficult, extremely difficult for us to find a profit comparable or desirable comparable. So that's, that's a big struggle we are facing. Currently, we can't share the tax filing information with other regions. It's more complicated and time consuming. So SAT is going to create a national database, which will more make the information sharing more convenient. First, I have to admit the pollution is a very serious problem in China right now. Even though it's very, very difficult to measure the pollution, we think at least it needs to be taken into consideration in assessing Chinese companies' contribution to the whole value chain of multinational companies. Of course, all these uh, plans need to be implemented by people. SAT is going to strengthen the workforce of transfer pricing specialists from the 150 to 500. Thank you for your attention. I hope you will get an understanding of China's transfer pricing system. Thank you. Uh, Richard Murphy. I think you said 73% of yes. your trade is with tax havens. Yes. This information is released by uh, the Ministry of Commerce and People's Republic of China. So uh, does that regime apply to multinationals investing in China, or it also applies to multinational Chinese multinationals investing abroad? Yes. Previously, the uh, four bits of audit are only enterprises with foreign investment, but currently we have shifted our focus uh, both on domestic enterprises and enterprises with foreign investment, especially domestic enterprises which invest in tax havens. Everyone I've spoken to in the tax administration says they don't know what to do with the request for exchange of information and 
almost all countries in Latin America use the OECD guidelines. The automatic exchange of information is advisable, but it doesn't exist in Latin America. And the challenge of the tax administration is to produce more information from the countries, more public information. I will comment a particular case in Guatemala. For some uh, narcotics case, the U.S. authorities require uh, some U.S. taxpayers' information making operations in, in Guatemala and, you know, and other countries. Uh, because of constitutional restrictions, this sort of agreement was signed, but it was bilateral. Uh, at this time, uh, even that many requirements of information from the Guatemalan tax authorities to the U.S. authority has made, none has been answered. Doesn't this argue for an insistence by the developing countries, by the countries in Latin America, for tax treaties that in fact require the exchange of information? This is like the free trade agreements. An idea would be that uh, the agreements were negotiated in a level of table, but all we, we all know that is not the case. In Mozambique, we do lack uh, capacity as well as uh, knowledge uh, with regard to this subject being discussed uh, from civil society point of view as well as from the government. The complexity of the transfer pricing system, coupled with a lack of capacity and expertise in developing countries, leaves those countries' tax systems open to abuse. How do we address the tax administration capacity challenges through coordinated action? Should the UN Tax Committee be expanded? Should it be more heavily funded? Should there be some other form in which developing countries can um, uh, express their own particular point of view and, and implement it? For, for me, what I really see as a very important way forward is first of all to bring uh, what we are discussing here uh, in line with our revenue authority management uh, bodies. Because if you speak to them, they seem to be so powerless. To some of them, actually, it's more, more, more like Latin, actually. They, they seem not really to be able to be able to understand them. But I think it would be very, very helpful if we can try to be able to help them out and to be able somehow to empower them. The message is very simple. The less developed countries are not up for sale, they are looking for partners. And I think if you can get that information very, very clearly to your governments in the north, to pass the same information to their companies, that would be very, very helpful. We have a big problem in the United States, no revenue. What did Congress do last time around in enacting the budget? Cut $300 million from the budget of the Internal Revenue Service. If we don't have that money, I can imagine what it's like in Tanzania. There has to be a global campaign for adequately funding revenue collection. We have a communication problem if we talk about transfer pricing, where deals are being made on tax which people find unacceptable. Put it in that way and people will get excited. When we discuss transfer pricing and the technical aspects, they go cold. So the messaging of this is we have to do the deeply technical stuff, we have to talk about this all. We're all very interested in it here, but the world outside is not going to be changed by these conversations until we can translate them into something quite different for the mass media and for ordinary people. I think the Guardian stuff did make a difference. When I've spent many head-banging hours reading accounts, if I'd wanted to be an accountant, I would have trained as an accountant, what am I doing? Campaigns are built on lots of things and the Tax Justice Network has been working for years and has been that resource and has laid the ground. The uh, really grassroots activist movement grew out of all these different things coming together so you suddenly saw UK Uncut with a kind of stroke of genius. I mean they were young, dynamic, politically astute, postgraduates mostly, thinking about tax as part of the problem with big political systems. And, uh, and they just turned the slogan and said, you know, we've paid what we owe, you pay what you owe. And that was, that was the kind of clever thing that turned tax from something that everybody hates into throwing it back to the people who are dodging it. Um, One tangible thing that's happened while we're talking is that in London, a judge has just given a group of campaigners the right to get a judicial review of a settlement that Goldman Sachs got with the uh, HMRC in London. 
So uh, there's going to be a court case over a tax settlement. The people bringing the judicial review are those very postgraduate student activists who were inspired by a lot of that work. Mm. And so, you know, that small steps, but it starts, the stone starts to roll, doesn't it? And it gathers huge momentum. The stone is rolling on the other side of the Atlantic as well. And stories and many publications we now have a movie. So we have a film about um, U.S. corporate tax evasion. It's being shown all across the United States. It's getting rave reviews. It manages to combine fairly detailed analysis of six or seven cases of transfer pricing abuse with uh, kind of a story about how, how tax activists have gotten mobilized. And what's amazing is when audiences see the movie, uh, as an audience, I was in the middle of in Salt Lake City, Utah, of all places. They stood up and gave the movie a standing ovation. Next time, what we think about meeting like this one, the next health thing it should take place in Tanzania, and we actually uh, the impact uh, of transfer pricing is actually visible. You can see it uh, on the streets. I think it's tempting as tax specialists for us sometimes to think we're getting a bit carried away and a bit obsessed and maybe there's more, more important things to worry about. But when someone comes to the subject fresh, I'm always surprised how they often find it more outrageous than we as tax specialists do and it kind of indicates that we're onto something. So this is the moment.